tonight we have a very, very special guest. Uh, what I thought was going to be uh, George Bush, but I'm not sure what happened. He may have had to have a substitute. Who, who am I speaking with? Uh, this is not George W. Bush, okay? This is not the former president of the United States. <laughs> this is the current, as in, as it happens right now, right with the American people, live from my little cave in the basement of the White House. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised with how busy you are. I'm kind of surprised that you would have time to do this. I'm honored and it's such a privilege, but, but is there anything else that you have going on that might interrupt this conversation? Well, it could be, you know, uh, the, the, you never know when the little red bell is going to ring. Okay. But, uh, but John, the world pretty much revolves around me. So we don't have to worry about anything right now. It's just you and me and all of your millions of fans. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Hey, <laughs> I I know you have kids and I've always wondered this. This is quite the surprise that I'm actually able to talk to the real Donald Trump. I know you have kids and, and they seem to be very loyal to you. Uh, what have you done that, to make that happen? Well, actually, you know, it, it's, it's, that's a question that I get asked quite a lot because, you know, Ivanka and, Donnie Jr. and Eric and Barron, of course, they're all so loyal, faithful, and as gracious as the day is long. They're going to make great, great American adults one day. I'm telling you that right now. Um, you know, it's, I like to describe it kind of like a shock collar. You know how when you have a little puppy dog and you, you want to train him, so you, you just put on this little you know, a little shock collar. And, and that way, when they start to go outside the yard, you know, you just push the button and he, he gets a little shock and it keeps him from going outside the yard. Well, I don't use a shock collar. I never used a shock collar on any of my children, of course, but my voice, okay, my very presence, many have said is shocking. And so I would say that I've used my own powers of intimidation combined with love and forgiveness intimidation combined with love and forgiveness in order to teach them the importance of being all in when it comes to respect and obedience interesting well i, I know we have a lot of fun too. a lot of laughter a lot of fun i know that you are married to a very gorgeous lady, Melania. And, uh, and, you know, but I do know there's been, you know, a few struggles here and there in the relationship department. But, but what's the secret to a long-lasting relationship? Well, once I have one, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. You know, I, can tell, I can tell you lots of ways how not to do it okay i can tell you lots and lots of ways to get it wrong okay i think i've got it right but only time will tell you know coming from a man who doesn't have any hair uh i am envious of your hair it almost ha seems to be magical okay. is it magical and who's your stylist you know nunzio has done a great job creating what i call the trumpador and he's, he really has worked hard at it. He's been with me many, many years since way back in the days when I was a little real estate developer in Manhattan. And of course, now we have to do a lot more work, okay, to keep the uh, magic mystery hole covered uh, with the way we do the bangs and the cover over. You know, I have actually eight different comb overs going at the same time. <laughs> That's... That's pretty magical, no doubt. It's not easy. It's not magic. It's hard work. If just, I like had... <laughs> just like your beautiful face? My tan, my beautiful tan. Yeah. Can't get this color just from the sun. <laughs> but I'm that... not going to reveal my It is a special orange that comes from somewhere, right? Yes, Tahiti. 
what is uh sorry i'm getting lost in my questions here if if you had to pick your favorite president who would it be really <laughs> do you have, do you have a favorite president besides yourself you know actually i'm having the time of my life john to be honest with you america has never had it so good okay can you just imagine if anyone else was navigating the world, I mean, America, the way I've been able to do, it's phenomenal, it's fantastic, it's huge, and it's only going to get better from here. Yes. Um, so one of the last questions we have is, what will you do after you leave the presidency? Well, the same thing I've always done. Be magnificent. And, and is there any, like, any steps or anything that other people can do to be magnificent? Or is that just kind of a, a Donald Trump thing? Well, and it, you know, many have tried, okay, but no one has ever quite risen to, well, I had, one has, one has, and I think you and I know who he is. He didn't have to rise because he was great before he was born, so that's cheating if you ask me. But as far as people who were born of a woman and a normal father, I think I'm pretty much the greatest. What was your question? I forgot. <laughs> I, um, yes, what will you do? Oh, well, I think you answered it. I said, what would you do after leaving the presidency? Yes, yes, be magnificent. And <laughs> emulate, read my books, okay? Do what I do. And that's how you can do it. But good luck because no one can do it like me. Interesting. Well, you know, it's, it's, it, again, it kind of took me by surprise because I thought I was going to be interviewing George Bush and, and to have you here in front of me is, is quite the honor. Well, thank you, John. I, I agree. The honor is yours. <laughs> and uh, do you know George Bush or are y'all friends or? Always, always, always study your opponents. Okay. And I knew I wasn't going to be an opponent of George W. per se, but I knew that I had to take on his front runner brother. Okay. His front runner brother. I almost got a tongue twister there and I never get tongue twisters. So that would have been a first on your show here tonight. All the men out there seeking how to be a greater fathers would have seen Donald Trump's first ever tongue twister. First mistake ever, I'm sure. Oh, no, no, no. No, I've made mistakes. <laughs> oh, have you? I, I, you know, I noticed that you're really active on Twitter. Uh, I follow oh, you and try to keep up. I made Twitter, trust me. They won't admit it, but... If it weren't for me, Twitter would be a word like Twitter, but I can't think of one. Got it. Got it. Twitter yes. is such a little sounding word. They should have called it something like phenomenal. <laughs> you know, a tweet. A tweet sounds like something a little bird would do. Tiny. At least it should be a squawk, like an eagle. Hmm. Speaking of, is, you know, in, in past presidencies, you always hear the story about the eagle has landed, as in the Secret Service and how they, they talk about the president. Can you reveal your nickname at all as to what they say about you? Well, I can tell you what they say about me in reverence to hushed tones, but I can't reveal my code name because you never know who's listening Yes, you're ex you're exactly right. I, I can tell you what George Bush's secret code was. I can tell you what Clinton's secret code was because they're no longer the president. And I think they call them different things now. So you could tell us what George's, George Bush's secret code is and, and how might that be? I could tell you a lot about George Bush. A lot, trust me. How so? Because I know George W. Bush like the back of my hand. 
Do you want to know why and how and how it could be that I know George W. Bush? I would love to know that. So intimately. Well, folks, okay, I'm not really Donald Trump. I have been fooling with you. I know you all totally believed it, but it was just a little game I like to play because everybody knows I'm a big practical joker. It's me, George W. Hey, everybody, good to see you. <laughs> Oh, that was so fun. I bet I had all of you. <laughs> Woo, what a hoot. Let's see I, if I can fix this up. Here we go. All right, and get, get my normal George Bushy tie on. Yeah, all right. Almost set the red one in some ranch dressing. Oh, that's not good. Call, I'm actually at the ranch, okay? I'm not, this really isn't the White House. This is a uh, ranch. Laura, honey, would you bring me another cup of coffee? Thanks, baby. It's good to see you. What's up, John? It was actually me all along. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a shocker. I had no idea. Well, you know, I I I, I love to uh, practical joke, and uh, and uh, lately I've been working on my my Trump impression, and uh, it's hard. It's hard, you know, because I'm so humble, and he's so not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're right. You're right. Now, now that I mean, I'm I'm still kind of in a state of shock over here because I thought Donald <laughs> Trump. Now I get to talk to the W. Isn't that the, the, isn't that what they call you? W. Starts with a D. <laughs> w. Yes, W. Does start with a D, and and you know what I heard, Mr. President. Here's the thing, I have a a tendency of calling people bro and dude. That's just the way kind of I talk. Is it? Do yeah, I have your permission to call you bro or dude? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Dude, Mr. Finchy. <laughs> yes, dude, President. That I like that that really well, dude, President. Yeah, DP. DP. Also starts with a D, as in W. You know, I call uh, uh, Carl Rove TB. Stands for Turd Blossom. <laughs> and, and so my question where I was headed was, I heard that you are a painter and you love painting. Is there anything in specific that you like painting? Yes, I like painting our nation's heroes. I've painted all kinds of weird things. Um, I always paint our Christmas ornament. I do a, uh, some sort of a finch uh, or some kind of bird, and then they turn it into a Christmas ornament every year from the library. It used to be from the White House, of course, now from you know from the uh, George W. Bush Presidential Library. And uh, we send them out, and there, there are people who are uh, subscribed, and they get them every year automatically, and uh, they love them. I get good feedback on them. But my favorite thing to paint is uh, the portraits of our nation's heroes who have come back from the field of battle with injuries. And uh, it's, it's one way that I can tell their stories and uh, give back to them. And I, I, love, I love honoring those who've served because they are worthy. They are so worthy of our nation's respect, uh, appreciation, and honor. Amen. How is Laura? I heard you speaking to her earlier. How's she doing? She's kicking butt, taking names. She's got that reading program going. She's she's just loving life and living large. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, did I hear correctly that how y'all met was she was a librarian or something? Well, that's why I checked her out in the first place. <laughs> okay. Were you there to actually get a book or just a book with a lot of pictures? Well, you know, the, the story is uh, that uh, I was there checking out a book and, and she was behind the counter and she looked up at me and said, uh, you got any ID? And I said, about what? <laughs> and, and so then the legend began. That's where the legend began, right there at the checkout counter. That's where I checked her out. <laughs> this is a show for married people, so, you know, we can talk. Yeah, 
You're you're right. Yeah, we can. What's and speaking of marriage and and we're going to talk fathers in a minute. She here. was a she was a uh, an English. Uh, she was a librarian, but she also was an educator. You know, and she taught me about uh, how to fix my vernacular. That's a pretty big word, Mr. President. Yes, yes. I, I I just made up a joke, and I don't know if I can tell it, you know, because I'm not sure if it's appropriate, but I think it is. So I'm just going to say it. It's a joke. I'm making it up right now. And you tell me if it's appropriate. If it's not, I apologize. On, on our first date, she taught me my first tongue twister. <laughs> That's a kissing joke, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so was that appropriate or not <laughs> that's totally fine it's totally fine okay okay L let me ask you this turning red <laughs> what's so the uh, yeah what's the secret to being a great husband and father well you know you you carry a great uh, deal of responsibility as, as a husband um there's a uh there's a passage in the Bible in the, in the New Testament where it talks about how uh, marriages are a symbol of God's relationship with uh, his people, with the church. And uh, in, in the end days, uh, at the end of everything, um, the Bible says that Jesus will come for his bride. And so the way Christ treats the church with forgiveness and love and care and he's always there for you. He encourages you. He leads you. He's there. That's our role as men, to treat our wives in the same way. And it's not a lot different as, uh, as fathers. You know, we, we treat our children as better than ourselves, as, as uh, more important, and uh, give them the best that we have. And, uh, you know, they'll benefit from it for the rest of their lives. I'm not saying I've done that perfectly. But uh, I try to love them unconditionally and, uh, you know, be there for them. Well, I think you've done an amazing job with your, with your daughters. Uh, very, very nice young ladies and, and seem to be doing so well. Kind of the last question as we wrap up here. Do you still talk to Dick Cheney or any of the cabinet, cabinet members? Well, yeah, we... Uh, we we play golf and shoot rifles and stuff. You know, we get the fifty cal out in the woods, and you know, and uh, you you, you got to be careful when you're hunting with Dick Cheney, though. <laughs> if somebody That's... yells duck, you better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I heard he was in some kind of incident. I think while he was your vice president, right? Yeah, he shot a lawyer. Well, who can blame him? <laughs> well, I mean, you're going to shoot somebody. <laughs> John C. Morgan, brother, man, it is so cool. Uh, it is so cool to visit with you, dude. And, and I'm, Thank you, Don. I'm, I am so thankful that Christopher Sean Shaw connected with connected us because I love your story of, of what God's done in your life and how he led you into what you're doing today. Kind of piece that together for us, man. Tell us how that all came about. Okay. You know, it's, it's so hard. I've got to get used to looking at you instead of looking at you because your image is here, but the camera is here. And so I want to look into the camera so I can see you as is perceived by everybody watching. So I'll, I'll do my best to focus over here. But if I go like that, please forgive me. Hey, hey, John, I'm a lot better looking in real person, too, just so you know. Oh, I can see that, yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, tell us the story, brother. Um, my wife and I both came out of a sexually abusive environment, and uh, we were lucky to make it out alive. Seriously. And God, Psalm 40 is our theme verse. Uh, he drew us out of the mud and the mire, out of the miry clay, and set our feet upon a rock. He put a hymn in our mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in, in God. Um, not a lot of people would have had 
a lot of hope for either one of us individually. But God sees what men don't see. And so when we should have been given up on, God rescued us. And out of his kindness, brought us together in an amazing, romantic a meeting, how my wife and I met. And we don't have t- enough time for that story, but maybe on another show, we could start there. It's a great story. My wife and I met and fell in love at first sight. And after all we had been, been through, neither one of us were looking. But we met, and that, that was that. Um, within three months, we were engaged. And six months later, we were married. And I was a singer-songwriter at the time. And my desire was to be a Christian singer-songwriter for a career. But I knew nothing about business. I barely know anything now. And um, I was pretty much starving. My budding family um, had all kinds of, you know, I, I just confess it because why not be real? This is a great venue for it. I had real character issues. Uh, I was lazy. Um, I'd book a gig and, and celebrate for the rest of the week instead of keeping working, you know? And I did not do well in, in terms of responsibility. So it was a struggle. We struggled as a young family. And it wasn't long before the Lord spoke to my pastor and had him instruct me that I needed to get a real job. So I went to work in my mom and dad's appliance store that I, I basically was raised working in that store and uh, went back there, you know, with my tail tucked between my legs, can I have my job back? And they were very gracious and welcomed me back. And they didn't say I told you so, but they told me so. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I, I thought I would be back working there for, you know, f- you know, while God worked on my character. You know, I thought, well, what's that going to take? Two or three weeks, you know? <laughs> and uh, two or three weeks turned into 20 years, and I was still working in the appliance store. And um, my heart yearned to be on the stage, serving people and helping people. But God instructed me to focus on my family. So I continued to serve on the worship team at my church and then give the rest of my time to our uh, our our budding family and uh, we had four young sons we actually had three uh that never made it past the womb they're already in heaven waiting for us uh, and our four sons we chose to homeschool from kindergarten to uh graduation now it was uh, you know kind of a modified type of homeschool because whole lot of our friends were doing it too so we formed co-ops and did all these things and then plugged them into um, a, a local school to do some of their classwork and it was really fun it was a great great experience and I was home a lot of the time so that helped so tell me like how did the whole impersonating George Bush what what tell me that story how did that even come about uh you know it's funny. When I hung this, um, I'm, I can't think of the word, but when I hung my guitar in the closet to lay down my ministry, in a sense, I, I want to say proverbially speaking, I know that's not the right word, but whatever the word is, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. And it wasn't audible, you know, but in my spirit, the words were clear, so clear that I remember them to this day. He said, just remember that I used Moses after 40 years on the backside of the desert. Well, when you're 20 something, the last thing you want to hear about is when you're 60 something, he's going to use you, you know? Um, But I tucked that away. And, uh, you know, 20 or so years after I quit doing that and went back to work full time, George Bush decided to run for office and for, for president, he was already governor of Texas. Uh, His brother Jeb was our governor here in Florida. And 
somebody came up to me and said, you know, you look a lot like W. That's the first time I actually heard that phrase. And I said, who's W? And they said, oh, that's George W. Bush running for president. And then after that, as his face became more and more recognizable and he won the nomination, I started hearing it every day almost, you know. And so I just thought that was cool. I had no idea there was something you could do with that. And it was actually three years later when somebody introduced me to the whole idea of being a celebrity lookalike. And when they first suggested that to me, the idea was so preposterous that I just said, absolutely no way. Um, it conjured up an image in my mind that was not positive in the least. And so I just wanted to have nothing to do with it. But a few months later, my wife saw someone impersonating George Bush on The Tonight Show. And she went and did a web search. And when she saw how much money the guy made, she woke me up out of a dead sleep. And she goes, honey, I just found your new career. You're gonna become a George Bush impersonator. I can still recall looking up, out, waking up to her face, you know, looking at me. And I'm like, what? And I still didn't wanna do it because of all kinds of reasons, pride, fear, um, looking stupid, being a laughing stock, failing. Um, but then God, another, I had another, um, John, I've had about five instances where God spoke so clearly to me, it might as well have been audible. This was one of them. He said, how do you know it's not God? And when he said that, I knew I had to find out because I was sure God did, God wouldn't want, God wouldn't want somebody to do something that stupid but that was just me. So when I heard that in my heart, I began to pray about it. And indeed, God did confirm that he wanted me to become a George Bush impersonator. And I just like, I was shaking my head thinking, what in the world? But you know, John, God sees around corners. And what you, you might think is gonna be one way can be so different if you just trust the Lord. And I've, I've been on stages with 35,000 people. I've been on national television. I've been on, I pumped the whole nation of China <laughs> on their <laughs> national TV over there at a global automotive forum. And I mean, I've been on World Cup soccer stadium stages and I've been on America's Got Talent and The View and you just name it, as well as hundreds and hundreds of churches and corporations doing little you know keynote addresses. If you're at a conference, imagine you're at a conference and somebody says, folks, we've got a surprise guest for our keynote speaker. And all of a sudden you start hearing hail to the chief and secret service guys bust into the room. And, you know, and, and, and then it's me. Your, your mind is going to say, whoa, W is here, you know, and, and God's given me this really cool gift of, of humor and comedy and, and uh, inspiration. And I thought it was going to look one way. But God had a whole nother plan. And oh, I mean, if all that hadn't happened, you and I wouldn't be talking here tonight about fatherhood. See how, how that works? It's crazy and so fun. Dude, I, I love it. Do you remember your first gig as George W? Well, <laughs> my, I remember my first three. I'm not sure which one of them came first. But right after I made the decision to do it, there was a thing called a celebrity lookalike convention in Orlando. And um, I mean, people came from all over the country, really all, all over the world. And that was my debut. And I remember, you know, I had written my notes and the, the cool thing about a presidential impersonator is different from a singer. He can actually have a speech right in front of him. So I didn't have to actually memorize it, but I was going through my notes and, and I'd been, I'd get, I'd gotten to know the, the gentleman, Greg Thompson, who put the conference on fairly well, and he was rooting for me. He was standing in the back of the room, and I came out. And uh, when I when I looked down at my notes, it didn't make sense, and I realized I was on the wrong page. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm picking up a page here and picking up a page here, and the crowd started laughing, like, "Oh, this is so George Bush," and 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 uh, my friend Greg was in the back of the room, and he leaned over to his friend and said. No, he really messed up his script. <laughs> so that was that was probably the actual first public appearance. Yeah, a lot of fun. 
So tell me your story and growing up, like your relation, is your dad still alive today? He is alive, very much alive in heaven. Oh, there you go. What, what was your story like growing up with him? Was he good, bad, and different? I mean, kind of give me the, give me the scoop there in your relationship with him. Okay. Well, we grew up a normal Catholic family. Uh, Dad ran a new and used appliance store. And uh, my stomping grounds, I used to hang out in the back of the store because he had a graveyard of old appliances. And that was my, that was my you know, battlefield, you know? And uh, I mean, you open up an old refrigerator and there's a thousand roaches just ready to pour out at you, you know, and they're the enemy ah, with the bug spray, you know, and uh, but but we had fun. He took me fishing a lot and uh, taught me how to play golf. My my uncle was a golf pro and my dad played golf an awful lot. So he, he was a, a, a really loving and uh, a good father. I enjoyed my my life growing up. What did he teach you as a dad? How to have fun. Nice. Yeah, he, he wasn't a hands-on kind of an edgy. He taught me how to play golf, and he taught me how to fish. And he wasn't a moral example. Um, you know, I found his stack of Playboys uh, at, a, at a young age, and um, his motto was, and I'm, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of ragging on him right here, but I don't think he'll mind. He'd, he'd want me to share the lesson so that nobody else – does this his motto was don't do as i do do as i say do so that wasn't really all that good <laughs> i can't <laughs> i can't imagine that being good advice but uh hey know. sometimes i wish that's what i could tell my kids too because <laughs> <laughs> i'm not always the best example but you know what to, to what you said too john you know and i a lot of the people i interview they do feel this kind of like they're dishonoring their father in some way. And I, and I try to tell people, you know what? Um, it's not dishonoring your father. It's being real and, and, and knowing that again, and I've said this many times, he could only give what he had, right? He only knew how to be a father to the extent that his father showed him or, or whatever he learned. So, you know, in my case, it, that was connecting the dots to make me realize and find forgiveness for my dad yeah. Because ultimately he could only give what he, what he had. And so, you know, I talk to men all the time and women too. It's just like, if they can get that and understand that it's a huge piece toward that journey of forgiveness and healing and freedom because, because of just what it does. I mean, again, even as me as a dad, I wounded my kids. Hopefully I haven't wounded them as much now that I kind of um, walking in a different awareness, but I'm not perfect. I mean, there's stuff my kids are going to go, man, he screwed me up. I'm going to need to go to counseling for years, <laughs> you know, or whatever, right? You never know. But I will say, though, I, I had the privilege of leading my dad to the Lord. And that was That's a cool. wonderful honor. Um, it was the day of the Oklahoma City bombing. And um, the rest of us had all become uh, devoted Christians and, and serious followers of the Lord. And dad wanted to stay and be the sane one in the family. So he held back and didn't jump with both feet in. Uh, but he, you know, he applauded us all for being big time Christians. And um, the day of the Oklahoma City bombing, bombing, though, it rattled his cage. Because this was long before 9-11. But it was the biggest deal up until that time. And if it could happen in Kansas City, it could happen anywhere. And he really lost his peace. He lost his every day's the same sense of security. And so that day we were working together at Morgan Appliances at our store. And he said, John, tell me more about the relationship you and mom have. My, that would be my mother uh, with, with the Lord. And I was able to share some scriptures with him and share the difference that being all in with Christ made in my life. And that day he made a confession. He allowed me to lead him in prayer. And John, he changed that day. And for the rest of his life, he served God with passion. And I mean, told people about Christ when they would come into the store. It was, it was precious. Wow. I mean, you know, beyond your wife and your kids leading your father to the Lord. I mean, that's, that's got to be just one of your greatest memories ever, huh? Without a doubt. And it, and it thrills me to know that God allowed me to have a hand in 
the fact that I, I know where he is and I know I'll see him when I get, get to heaven. Now you have four sons. Tell me, tell me what's been your biggest struggle as a dad and how did you overcome it? Their rebellion, which is no different than my rebellion was when I was their age. Um, they, I don't know, somehow or another, they, they have a life of their own. I don't know how that works. <laughs> yeah, to, that's, it's not supposed to be that way. <laughs> they're supposed to have my life. What's the deal? Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, they, they, they were very obedient. All four of those kids. Um, one thing I did for my wife early on, I never tolerated sass. I never tolerated talking back. And we, and I don't know if I did it out of self-preservation or I don't remember what my motive was, but we just had this rule that whatever they wanted, they would tell me the whole story and I would listen patiently and they, they needed to give me every argument and then I would make a decision and that would be it. That would be final. And I never varied from that and it saved so much pain and headache because my mom and dad, their philosophy was never say yes the first time make them work for it. Well, that just treat that just trained us to be argumentative and manipulative, you know? And and now and now we have to fight out of those things. So I just knew that wasn't the way to do it. So we went a different route and my wife and I have been spared a lot of headache from arguing and all of that because the kids just it was just never an option to them and they they knew it and they, they abided by it. So I'm very grateful. Wow. That's so cool. What a great lesson too. Cause I think so many of us struggle with as fathers in that, and, and it's, you know, trying to help your kids understand that you're not trying to be mean and implementing rules and things of that nature. You're, you care for them. You love them. You're trying to protect them. But so many times our kids don't get that. And it's that, you know what, it's the worry. I think one of the biggest worries all of us fathers have is, the one who strays or the one that, you know, kind of walks away from God. And, and it's just understanding that at some point it's like, man, it's no longer me. It is all you Lord, because you're the only one that can, can, it can help here, you know? Right. Right. It's, it's very true. I always, um, re I, I, if I had any regrets now, it would be that I did not do a good job walking them into a personal relationship with Christ. I taught them. I taught them how to. I modeled it. I showed them what I did, but I didn't kneel next to their bed and pray with them like I should and, and, and really nurture that relationship like I should have. And that's one thing. If you're a young dad, my biggest, the biggest takeaway from this conversation would be for you to nurture your child into a relationship with Christ. Don't just teach it and don't just model it. Do those things, but also walk them through it. Have them practice it and develop it themselves from a very early age so that it'll be real to them when you're no longer at their side every day. Brother, man, you are so, so the real deal, dude. So genuine. And I love it. Just the authenticity uh, um, and what you've talked about. And I think that's what men, dads, it's what I need to be reminded of, right? It's what all of us, there's so much that we all need to be reminded of and can learn from one another. I learned something from every interview I do. And, and it's just fascinating how God brings those things together. And let me ask you, as we kind of begin to wrap up here, what's the best thing about being a dad? The love. The, the love relationship with those boys. Um, I had my uh, third son over for, di for spaghetti dinner just before uh, this call. And uh, he and I were sitting on the piano bench together, playing some songs and playing the ukulele and hanging out. And I have a very deep and affectionate relationship with all four of my sons. And uh, I'm so grateful that, you know, God gave me the grace to nurture that from their early age. 
it, isn't it amazing too when you become a dad how unconditional love means a whole nother thing i mean i don't think you understand it until you become a dad right <laughs> you how can you it's the experience that gives you the experience if you will um George Bush talks about, a lot about unconditional love uh, for, for his kids. And he said, just love them. I mean, when they were running around dancing on bar top tables, you know, and when they were in their crazy days and they had their crazy days, George Bush's daughters, George Bush said, I just love them. I'm just here for them, you know? And that's, sometimes that's all you can do uh, other than pray. And of course, praying is the most important thing. Uh, the hard work that's invisible, that, that means the most. Um, but then just loving them and, and, you know, here's the key, treat them exactly the way Christ treats you. Hey, man. Other people don't treat, other people don't treat me with the same grace that Christ does. And if I treat my wife and my kids with the same grace that Christ extends to me, what, you know, when he caught the woman in the act of adultery, he didn't say, you're so evil. Oh my gosh. How could you? You're disgusting. How could you do that? You're going to embarrass me. No. He just said, no one's condemning you. I'm not condemning you. Don't do it again. Isn't, isn't that amazing? You know, I've thought more and more as of recently in trying to father my kids the way God fathers us. So I love that, that analogy. And I think the grace part is something I don't think I understood grace until the last several years of what God's grace really was. And knowing that it's like, man, if, if men, if dads can just keep that little piece of advice in mind, if we could father our kids the way God fathers us with the grace and the love and forgiveness, that's a game changer. That's a game changer. What's, what's one piece of advice you would give a, a brand new father? Don't let anything surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I, is funny. I remember when I was a little kid and there were some uh, pruning shears in our carport and, and a hose. And I wondered if the pruning shears would cut the hose. And I found out that it would. I, I, I had no malice. I wasn't trying to be mischievous. I just wondered. So I did it, and you know, I, I, when my uh, my nuttiest son Stephen, which he would chuckle at that uh, description because he knows it's true, but I say it in a very endearing way. When he was younger, one day we were in my uh, car, and the window was half down in the back seat where he was, and he had a pair of pliers because it was a uh, work work work-related uh, vehicle and he wondered what would happen if he grabbed the window with the pliers well what do you think happened <laughs> the window just shattered and i just laughed because i knew exactly what he did and why he did it he just did it he didn't mean any malice he didn't you know think about it ahead of time ha huh, i'll get dad hot no Kids, they do the craziest things. Dude, I, I agree. I think one of the mistakes I made early on as a father, as a young father, was I always had this tendency to say, you know better than that when, you know, the kid's like three. <laughs> 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 you know, you're like, you know better than that. No. Even they were 10 and 11, they would make mistakes. And I'd say, you know better than that. I was like, well, hold on a second. She's 10, dude. <laughs> you know, whatever. Hey, brother, I appreciate your time. Let's tell people about your latest thing. I know you have kind of a cameo, the, the oh, bush. Yeah. Tell people about that. Okay. Um, I have this really awesome service called Bushgrams and Trumpgrams. And uh, you go to bushgrams.com. That's B-U-S-H, obviously, G-R-A-M-S. All one word, bushgrams.com. And I'll make for you a custom video for your dad for Father's Day. Um, and it's awesome. You can have Donald Trump or George W. Bush. You'll be able to select which one you want. And it, there's a special right now. And if you, if you purchase, you will also receive a free copy of my latest book, War on Fear, which is a really helpful book during trying times like these. So 
my motto is bushgrams.com. My motto is why send flowers when you can send a bush? <laughs> <laughs> so let W sing happy birthday or, you know, for he's a jolly good fellow to your dad for Father's Day. And um, I guarantee you, I've, I've sold hundreds of these things and every single one of them has been a home run. Home run, as, as Donna would say, they're huge. They're fantastic. <laughs> and now you have another book too, right? What's the name of the other book? Oh yeah, My Life is a Bush and My Heart for Imitating Jesus. As a comedian, both of my books are very funny, but they're both meant to draw you closer in your relationship with Jesus. Brother, I love it, love it, love it. Man, I love what God's doing with you and the platform he's given you and the stories. I am, I, I've heard just a few of the stories and I, I, I'm sure you have hundreds of thousands of just impersonating books, him and what's happened. The books are loaded with the stories and um, this one you can get by going on, you can get either book by going on Amazon or this one you can get autographed from me by going to waronfearbook.com waronfearbook.com and I'll autograph it. Um, there's a place where you can tell me I, if there's something specific you want me to say, I can, I can do that. And uh, they make great gifts also for your father. So buy a bush, Graham, get a book. There you go, brother. Oh, can social media. I know you're on Twitter and Facebook. Yes. So is it, Don it go ahead. And also Donald Trump impersonator is a is my facebook fan page john c morgan is my george bush fan page and donald trump impersonator is my donald trump facebook fan page that's a lot of words and uh, you can also find me at bush guy and at trump guy love it love it man keep doing what you're doing brother i greatly appreciate you taking this time to do it it's my pleasure god bless you and god bless all your peeps